for the invitation and uh, I should also thank uh, Sebastian as well and uh, it's a shame that he can't be here today but, but thank you for the invitation and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, <coughs> Uh, I should say, of course, this is a research that uh, that I'm involved with in collaboration, actually, with my co-researcher uh, Amira Satwadeva over there. Uh, so we've been busy collecting data and uh, analysing the data. So, although I'll be presenting, it is very much a collaborative piece of work. Um, and I suppose because I'm presenting, all all errors are mine in this case. Um, it, it is a work in progress paper, so I do welcome your comments criticisms um, and, uh, and any suggestions that you have. Um, okay, so um, so why, why are we looking at Central Asia? Partly, uh, and, and why does it matter? Um, and I think when we think about these kinds of issues, we are thinking about space. Why does space matter per se? And often when we think about Central Asia, it's usually framed around either geopolitical lens in terms like the Great Game Theory, uh, or in more political economy terms, such as the World System Theory, where you have core nations and peripheral nations, and, and in between that, the semi-peripheral nations. Um, I don't think these perspectives are per se uh, um, wrong, I just think they're slightly one-sided. Uh, and that they tend to neglect the nature of capitalism, uh, global capitalism in particular. Uh, the analysis tends to be primarily done at the level of politics, not really paying adequate attention to how capitalism, and in particular the crisis and contradictions of capitalism, shapes space. Uh, and, <clears throat> and very much my, my paper is about trying to understand this. How does crisis of capitalism impact how space is shaped by various global powers, who are also happen to be, uh, and importantly, happen to be capitalist uh, uh, powers. <coughs> so, um, so this paper is very much trying to address that particular gap in that literature, um, which, which tends to get uh, missed out. Uh, I should also mention here that that in uh, addressing the contradiction and crisis of capitalism, the state becomes a very important actor in this because it's the state projects and state strategies that help to regulate uh, capitalism. And, and, and I will talk about that uh, a bit later on. But the state plays a major role in how it constructs, construes uh, both space, territory, and in doing so, help to shape how uh, capitalism is directed in favour of one nation opposed to another. In talking about capitalism, it tends to be dry. <laughs> Uh, people kind of just think, uh, slightly switch off because they just think it's just about economics. Well, yeah, it is about economics, but it's also about political legitimacy. It's about how states are able to mobilise legitimacy for its particular cause, for its particular strategy and project. Uh, and and in, in doing so, it draws upon social, cultural imaginaries in order to <coughs> achieve that political legitimacy. Of course, it also draws upon moral justification as well. It's not purely about might. It's also about that this is somehow better for, for the world or, or for society, per se. As I will argue uh, uh, later on, uh, these, these strategies that the state employ are past-dependent, are partly past-dependent. They, they are partly shaped historically by what happened before and also by what other people are doing, what other countries are doing. So they're relational. They just don't happen in a vacuum. They're, they're very much uh, dependent upon uh, what other nations are doing in terms of their strategies, uh, as well as also being historical. Um, now, I'm talking about, uh, I'm talking about uh, 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 contradiction of capitalism, and, um, and uh, forgive me, uh, this may be a bit, a bit obvious to most of you, what are the contradictions of capitalism? So apologies if this is a bit, bit, bit basic, a bit, uh, bit too much sociology 101, but it's perhaps worth reminding what are the contradictions of capitalism um, and, uh, and, the, and the different forms that they take. Um, these are structural. Uh, these, are, these are merely discursive. These are things that occur whether we recognise it or not. Uh, so, for instance, I, I kind of lay out there four major ones or four key ones, uh, but there are many others. Um, firstly, uh, 
wages. Wages is both a source of cost as well as a demand. Um, you know, if, if companies try to uh, reduce their costs uh, because they want to stay competitive, this will also impact the aggregate demand. Right? Uh, so these contradictions are, 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 are things that happen together. These, these qualities, these elements, are not something that either or, they're both. They happen at the same time. In addressing one, you, you're likely to uh, aggravate the other. Um, that's why they are, they are contradictions. Capital. Capital is both fixed uh, in order to be realised. It has to be fixed into, into factories, into uh, um, uh, labour, into uh, production. So they have to be uh, uh, embedded in particular uh, capacities, in particular productions. But at the same time, capitalists also wants to disembed them in order to make them to flows so they can find other ways of using capital for more, uh, uh, possibly for more uh, profitable areas. So there's always this tension of, of embedding and disembedding capital. It's, it's, it's this constant uh, contradiction about how this uh, uh, occurs. Uh, money is, is both a, uh, a medium of exchange nationally, which the state, the, 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 the central bank, have control over, but at the same time it's also something which is traded internationally which the state have very little control over. And as I will show, the nature of currency plays a big part of this story about how uh, 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 global powers try to shape Central Asia. Uh, finally, uh, the state uh, plays a key role here. Because on the one hand, it, 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 it is embedded within a capitalist state, capitalist society, uh, in which it wants to valorise capital because capitals, uh, capitalists themselves are disorganised, too fractured to, to, uh, uh, to organise capital themselves, uh, the, the conditions in which capitalism can occur, so the state takes on that role. But yet at the same time, the state also has to ensure social cohesion. It can't be too one-sided. If it does so, it, it does result in unrest. Uh, and causes skirmishes. So it has to ensure both valorisation of capital as well as social cohesion. And the state, at any one moment in time, uh, at any one period of time, has to strategize how it's going to resolve these contradictions. Which element is it going to prioritise? So in terms of wages, is it about the cost side or is it the income side? Uh, in terms of thinking about uh, 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 money, is it going to put more importance to, the, to, to, to its exchange as its currency as an international currency or one in which it has control over in terms of domestic one? So these are dilemmas that each state has to uh, engage with and they try to resolve them temporarily anyway because they are, <coughs> these contradictions are in themselves irresolvable so you can only have temporary fixes in, 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 in trying to address these. Um, okay. So what do I mean by fixes? I've been using this term. So by fix, I, I mean how state, uh, uh, how, uh, state projects and strategies in trying to resolve crises and contradictions. And fixes themselves then uh, uh, come together in terms of uh, regulating the uh, regime of capital accumulation. So this is what I mean by by fixes about how at one at any one moment in time, state employs strategies and strategies in order to resolve these contradictions, and they take different forms. Right? These and, and these different forms are not necessarily uh, uh, mutually exclusive, but they are they they do depend on each other. But at any one moment in time, particular fixes. A particular strategies, uh, projects take on more priority than others. So let me give you uh, some uh, three fixes that will become important later on in the talk. Uh, firstly, uh, what I call a spatial fix, uh, which is uh, one in which the state tries to invest in infrastructure and communication in order to uh, give it uh, uh, its, its, its capitalist access to markets and to reduce uh, costs. So this is sometimes called a spatial fix. 
it's, it's very much about shaping territories in particular ways so that uh, you build roads and railways. Now, some of you more discerning uh, audience will, will, will realise which of these fixes apply to particular uh, global powers. And you get prizes later on if you can identify the right fix for the right global power. Uh, the, the second fix, which I call the institutional fix, is about how uh, uh, particular institutions are missing in, 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 in particular nations, which, uh, which, which uh, inhibit growth, economic development. So it's about putting in, getting the right institutions, uh, economic institutions, public institutions, whether it be the courts, whether it be property rights, uh, as a way of trying to facilitate business and to make businesses grow. Um, also, in some cases, to uh, uh, develop the banking sector uh, in order to facilitate uh, 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 businesses' access to credit. And, and this is what's sometimes called institutional fix. Uh, and then the uh, third fix, I yeah, call the, the scalar fix, which is that uh, the level of intervention that the state takes on can vary at different levels. Uh, it's never just at the level of the national level, it's also at the level of the uh, local level, regional level, and the supranational level. Just think about EU, for instance. EU is a great example of how uh, states get together, operating at various levels, um, uh, at, this, at, the super, at the supranational level, but also operating at regional levels. Uh, for example, southern, southern, uh, 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 southern Europe, uh, Greece, uh, uh, parts of Italy, uh, in order to help its development. So, scalar fix means that interventions occur at different uh, institutional uh, levels and never just primarily at one level, whether it be the, the national or the local. And what the state tries to do is that it tries to, through, through these fixes, is trying to create what, what was called uh, a struct structural coherence. Um, in, in that there is some sort of logic behind how these fixes occur uh, and, and how they operate. And they bo involve both material elements as well as discursive elements. Um, uh, a good example of this is, for example, in, in terms of discursive one, is China, the Silk Road Initiative. Uh, you know, it's, it's not merely about infrastructure, it's also how it conjures up uh, ancient, ancient history. You talk about the ancient Silk Road. It's a discursive element to these uh, structural fixes that are just as important as the material and economic ones. So social cultural imaginaries play an important part of this uh, and, never, and it's never just merely economic but at the same time it's never merely discursive. Um, uh, the success of these fixes, the structural coherence, depends upon the capacity of the state. The greater the capacity of resources the state has the more likely it, it fixes are likely to be met with success. But the process itself is likely to be fuzzy and messy. There's no guarantee of success at all. Um, in, 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 in that uh, these are complex issues, contradictions are by themselves irresolvable, so they are going to be messy, uh, and in resolving one contradiction, you're likely to store up problems elsewhere in the system. Uh, and may not be able to prioritise adequately other fixes, other contradictions that are, uh, are, are uh, uh, coming up. So uh, the process of fixing, the process of uh, structural coherence is one which is littered with compromises, failures, as well as obviously uh, 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 trial and error and imitations. Uh, but they are partly path dependent as I will uh, show a, a bit later on. So what are my key arguments here, right? And then I will go into, into the, um, the analysis. Uh, so I suppose I've got uh, three key arguments here. The first argument that I will make is that, um, that the global powers, and here I mean uh, primarily I mean uh, the United States, China and Russia, are competing to fix Central Asia to address their own contradictions and crises in their own economies. So it's very much about how they're using Central Asia to resolve their own uh, problems uh, uh, 
weaknesses <coughs> in their own economies. Now, these these weakness, these fixes, as I call them, can be uh, uh, in conflict with each other, but they can also complement each, each other as well. And that's something that that will hopefully will uh, uh, come apparent. What then also emerges is that is that in talking about uh, uh, global powers and competing, what I, what I do suggest is that uh, these nation states uh, don't operate in isolation of each other. They, they very much operate within the world economy. Right? They they are uh, uh, dependent upon each other. It uh, it's, it's part of a capitalist system that they are uh, engaging in. It's not just merely uh, uh, varieties of capital, as, as one set of literature calls it, but very much a part of a variegated capitalism. The uh, second argument that I will make is that what we are seeing through the lens of Central Asia is a move away from neoliberal unipolar international order towards what, what, what has been sometimes referred to as the post-Western multipolar order. And by looking at both China and Russia and how they address their particular uh, contradictions and how they are meeting these ch their, their challenges by, by shaping Central Asia, uh, hopefully I will uh, demonstrate this. But this movement is by no means to suggest that we are entering an anti-capitalist stage or an anti-market stage or even an anti-liberal stage. Right? Far from it. All these global powers are very much capitalistic. These are, they're not offering alternative visions of capitalism. Far from it. Uh, they are very much a part of capitalism, uh, which does then uh, 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 lead to a critique about to what extent are they offering alternatives. And the uh, third argument that I will make is that the, capitalist, the Central Asian states themselves exercise statecraft in trying to negotiate with the uh, global powers to uh, develop uh, uh, and to, uh, 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 to, to attract resources uh, to meet its own uh, challenges in their own economies. So uh, these Central Asian states are far from merely being puppets or passive, they very much are exercising agency of their own in trying to uh, determine which one which, which uh, global powers, uh, they, which, which resources and how they're going to uh, use them uh, to address their specific problems. Now, in saying all this, as I said, uh, hopefully what will come out is that th th what these fixes are by, my, by no means are addressing issues of larger crises, if I call them, if I can call them, if I, if I can call it that, for example, environmental crisis or crisis of solidarity within a global solidarity. So how did I do, or how did we do this research? Um, so uh, we had uh, uh, two research questions. Uh, the first one was, what are the major problems in Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan? I'll be primarily looking at Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. So I know, I know I've been talking about Central Asia, but it's primarily through uh, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan that I will be addressing the fixes. So what, are, so what were, the uh, economic problems in these two <coughs> countries. Uh, and what problems and projects did the uh, international financial institutions tackle and fund? Now, I'm primarily looking at international uh, uh, financial institutions uh, as a way of looking into uh, global powers. Because global, because global powers operate, they don't necessarily operate directly. They operate through other institutions. Uh, important institutions. Um, so, for instance, uh, the, uh, the Gover uh, United States operates through IMF and World Bank. Um, in fact, uh, 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 the, the State Department and the Treasury are, are board of directors of IMF and the World Bank. So, so uh, here I'm talking about governance rather than just the government. Uh, how just you know, uh, there are many institutions that global powers use in order to achieve their particular objectives. It's near merely direct, uh, it's ne never merely just through uh, the cabinet, it's through other mechanisms, uh, what's sometimes called governance, that they're able to achieve their intended 
uh, goals. Uh, so uh, so it, 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 it's through the lens of these international financial institutions that will be looking at how global powers shape the region. And we interviewed almost uh, uh, over, over 15 uh, types of um, uh, financial institutions. Uh, the World Bank, I, 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 won't, I won't read them all out, you can, you can, you can see them all on the screen there. Uh, World Bank, IMF, uh, uh, Asian Development Bank, representing the, uh, what are called the US Western powers. Uh, and then you have the uh, Eurasian Development Bank the, and the Russian Kyrgyz Development, Bank, Development Fund, what I would say would represent the Russian side. Uh, and although we didn't get the chance to interview the, uh, the Chinese uh, um, financial institutions, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and the Silk Road Fund, we did nevertheless manage to talk to a, a senior official within the Chinese embassy to get their understanding of how financial institutions were operating in the region. Uh, we also consulted uh, various uh, reports uh, 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 published by the uh, multilateral development banks to understand what kind of projects they were, they were, they were funding in the region. Okay. And so what were our findings? So how am I doing for time? Am I, am I, am I doing okay? Yeah, yeah, you, you're fine. Okay, good, good. Okay, okay. Well, I think I think I should be on time. Okay, good, good. Okay, so uh, in terms of in terms of findings, so the first findings is is uh, what should not be too surprising uh, that the uh, the international financial institutions frame their economic problems according to their donor's interest. Well, of course, he that pays the piper calls the tunes, right? Uh, it would be a bit odd if, uh, if, if they take donors, major donors' money and do something different, especially if some of those donors also sit on the board of directors, uh, as, as, as in the case of uh, the US State Department and the US Treasury. So, um, so, and this is what we've more or less found, and, and, and I will uh, try to demonstrate this uh, in, in the next couple of slides. But I'm just kind of just giving you the summary of the, of the findings first. So, uh, very much framed how uh, uh, the, uh, the problems, the strategies that the international financial institutions use very much uh, uh, aligned with their donors' uh, beliefs and, uh, and values. And the, uh, and the kind of fixes that the, the international financial institutions use, the strategies that employed, also very much aligned with trying to address problems uh, 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 and needs of the major donors' economies, right? So let me just say that again. So the, the kind of fixes, the kind of strategies that the international financial institutions were using and, and developed and funded in the region, in, in Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan, very much directly or indirectly were benefiting uh, uh, the needs of the major donors' economies, right? So, so uh, again, as you would kind of expect, given that the major donors are major contributors to these international financial institutions. And so, now, if anything, if you don't get anything else in this paper, right, um, and everything's kind of, you know, not, not kind of clear, just, just take away this slide, right? <laughs> right. right. Just, just, just have that. Uh, and 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 then I think you will understand what what hopefully what is what is what is what is going on, right? I'll probably have to stand for this. It won't necessarily be good for for, for good uh, uh, recording, but but nevertheless, I think I think it kind of helps. So how to read this table, right? So uh, so you've got uh, three uh, what are called uh, types of uh, 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 global powers here uh, with different kind of economic beliefs. Right? So you have uh, the Washington Consensus, the New Liberal Model. Right? Then you have what Russia is trying to be trying to develop. Uh, of course, this is something that that the uh, 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 the West had been employing since the breakup of the Soviet Union in 1991. Then you have something that's been in the last five years emerging in various shapes and forms: the uh, Eurasian Economic Union. There, and then you have something that 
taking on increasing, uh, getting increasing attention is the Belt and Road Initiative, also sometimes called the Silk Road uh, Initiative. Right? And so, uh, so these are the key ways, key models, key uh, strategies, uh, macro strategies that are being used to shape the region. Right? Uh, the neoliberal Washington Consensus, the uh, Eurasian Economic Union, and the Belt and Road Initiative. All have their specific global powers as their main backers. Right? So, uh, whether it be uh, United States and Japan, Japan obviously through the Asian Development Bank, uh, Russia helps the largely to shape and fund the Eurasian Economic Union, and of course China with the, with the One Belt One Road. And I have to read, going down here, the rows. So the global powers, as I said earlier, operate through the uh, financial institutions. Governance. We're not mainly talking about government, but governance. Various institutions are used to promote the interest of the global powers. Now, these, in these uh, international financial inst institutions then uh, uh, have particular fixes, particular ways of addressing problems uh, that they feel to be important <coughs> in, in, uh, 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 in, in addressing economic development uh, uh, and growth in the region. So these fixes are ways in which they say, well, this will help to promote uh, and develop uh, countries' economies. So these are what I mean by fixes. So these branch institutions draw, draw and design these fixes, which then get realised through key projects. So key projects that it, that it promotes. Right? So fixes are not merely discursive, they're also material. They require particular interventions, particular sectors to uh, 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 promote. Uh, and, and, and this is what I mean by uh, key projects. And here, importantly, is, well, what are the effects of all this? What, what are the economic and political effects? Right? Which hopefully then go back to this, because the global powers want some of this, right? To be, for there to be a positive effect for, for their uh, major donors. Right? Okay? So this is how I will be reading this table. Okay? And, and, and what I will do is I will go through each of these columns. Okay? <coughs> So let's start off with the oldest and the most dominant uh, fix uh, and strategy, um, which is the Washington Consensus and the neoliberal model, operated through various uh, international financial institutions, such as the IMF, World Bank, Asian Development Bank, the International Finance Corporation, and the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development. And the kind of fix that it has employed, by and large, is what are called institutional fix, and what I mean by that is, is it's been trying to uh, uh, deregulate trade and finance. Right? It's very much about trying to liberalise markets, trying to ensure that there's a flow of goods and services go, go, going through the region. Because, because uh, neoliberalism is about trying to deregulate. It's trying to ensure that the space becomes one of, of flows, of, of, of ease of access, of uh, external actors coming into the market, uh, uh, achieving uh, uh, achieving uh, uh, natural natural resources, or or having access to uh, labour markets, uh, to to consumer markets. Uh, it's also about uh, developing. Uh, um, uh, it's, it's also about trying to ensure uh, that the public sector is reformed. Right. So public sector reform. Decentralisation. So it's not just merely about uh, deregulation. It's also about decentralisation of, of, of uh, the public sector to ensure that they're more accountable, more transparent. And and this is and and in terms of the key projects that uh, 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 these in, these financial institutions have funded in Central Asia, largely fit what we what we would expect, which is about helping small business, small medium-sized businesses to grow, uh, investing, uh, giving uh, loans for them to set up, um, uh, for example, uh, market credit loans. Uh, it's about uh, uh, developing of the banking sector, right, which is, which is an important part, uh, so that 
uh, uh, households and businesses can have access to credit. It's about deregulation uh, of, of trade so that they can have access to, as I said, natural resources. But importantly also, they can also acquire profitable quasi, quasi, uh, quasi monopolistic companies. So America has a huge stake in Kazakhstan, uh, ExxonMobil and Chevron, uh, uh, because it allows them to extract huge uh, rent uh, from owning uh, these carbon, carbon, hydro, hydrocarbon resources. <coughs> now, this uh, very much supports what I, would, what I would call the Western or US hegemony, because it helps to reproduce capital reproduce capital that very much aligns with, with US uh, interests. Now, what we then have is partly as, as, a, as, a, as a result of dissatisfaction with this, uh, with this model over the years, right? and especially in the last 10 years, witnessed the 2007-08 uh, the crisis. There's been dissatisfaction with this model, and over time, one way or another, uh, there's been a construction, another imaginary, which is called the Eurasian Economic Union, uh, largely advocated by Russia, uh, supported through its financial institution, the Eurasian Development Bank and the Russian Kyrgyz Development Fund. Now, its kind of fix is very different. So if in the Washington consensus it's about trying to create a borderless world, deterritorized world, in which people come and go, capital flows across nation states, right? So, you know, money that uh, banks in Kazakh Kyrgyz Bank have come from, you know, uh, from Washington, from New York, from London. Yes, that's what a deregulated capital does. Right? The Eurasian Union is very much about trying to re territorialize Central Asia try to not to create a, a borderless world, but to create a, a border, a custom union, in which its industries uh, can excel and uh, can thrive through, uh, 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 through economies of scale. So here space is not merely uh, a, a, a pure flow of, uh, a, a pure space of flow, but it's very much an embedded place. It's embedded in particular ties, uh, particular institutions that will enable uh, uh, the member, member countries to uh, uh, benefit. And, and this is what, what I would call uh, the scale of things. And how does this occur? Well, it occurs through having custom unions, uh, trying to promote uh, export-led uh, industries, and importantly, a dollar-free currency regime. And this is very important, because what we have here under the neoliberal model is the dollar hegemony. The hegemony of the world currency, which allows America to not to undertake its structural adjustment policies, right? uh, to allow to have budget deficit, trade deficit, and not to, take, uh, not to engage, not to undertake any of its IMF uh, structural adjustments. It can run up huge debts without having to worry about it. Why? Because other countries are willing to purchase uh, US Treasury, uh, Treasury bonds. <coughs> this obviously gives America huge advantages, what sometimes called seniorage advantages. It's able to engage in two wars in the last 10 years, 20 years, 15 years or so, right? Like, and pay for, and that to have tax cuts, etc., etc., etc which no other country can possibly do because of the, uh, the hegemony of the dollar. Russia and China recognize this. They recognize the unfairness of this system. And they wish to have a region, an economic bloc, which does not allow America to have the hegemony, the dollar, the, the hegemony. So they are trying to create a dollar-free uh, 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 regime. So what's sometimes also called de-dollarization. Not merely de-dollarization in the national economies within the country, but also how intra-government 
uh, uh, exchanges, loans, um, and paying off uh, uh, debts done through in other currencies other than the dollar, whether it be the RMB or the uh, ruble. Okay, now clearly you can see what Russia wants to do with this is to counter the uh, uh, the US hegemony, right? Uh, partly as through the custom union as well as the de-dollarization. And finally, we have uh, China's uh, model, which uh, has occurred around the same time. Now, um, this one is it's called a spatial fix, because what it, what what this is trying to do is 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 trying to uh, reshape the landscape, uh, to reshape the flows of trade to its advantage, from its Chinese factories to mature European factories at a much more speedier and less costly ways, but also to new markets, to the Middle East, to Africa, to Southern, uh, to, to South Asia. So it's trying to recreate the trade flows. So yes, it has similarities with this in trying to ensure connectivity, but not merely any connectivity, but connectivity which ensures uh, that China is able to address its particular crisis, crisis of over accumulation of capital. That's the crisis that uh, China is facing. And the spatial fix speeding up the uh, 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 flows through uh, infrastructure, transporting infrastructure, is one of the ways it, it, it is trying to uh, realize its uh, uh, goals. And that's exactly what we see. We see a lot of investment into, into transport. Again, very similar in terms of the, uh, the need to de-dollarize the region and to de-dollarize the world. So a lot of its uh, uh, loans agreements are in the RMB, not in the dollar, right? because it recognizes the unfairness of this system. And very much trying to counter the US hegemony. They're not trying to counter capitalism, <coughs> right? It's not about that. They're all very capitalistic in what they're trying to achieve, but they, they want to ensure that they have uh, some of their say as well, right? That the system is not loaded against, against other emerging uh, uh, powers. Now, it's, it's worth bearing in mind that these strategies didn't just come out of thin air. They came as, as a result of previous crises. Now, what do I mean by that? Now, this, as a, if you can just remember this, that's fine, right? You don't need to remember this. It's much more complex, right? But you, but you get the idea. The crisis, the neoliberal model came from a more historical crisis, which was the crisis of the Atlantic Fordism, right? The, the post-war consensus that emerged from 45 to late 60s. And then you had the crisis, and that's when you had the, uh, the, the dollar coming out, no longer being fixed to the gold under Nixon in 71. So this, this uh, 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 and, and this was, uh, the, the Atlantic Fortress was one where, where wages were seen as a, an income. What you have now under, under neoliberalism is wages as a cost, hence the importance that's given to competitiveness. So these crises, so neoliberalism was seen as a way of addressing the crisis of Atlantic Fordism, uh, and, 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 in, and, and in doing so, their faith, they're fixing the regions that it will allow uh, the West, the global powers, to uh, 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 reproduce capital in its in its favour. Whether, as I said, uh, kind of here, uh, giving access to natural resources consumer markets, in particular financial markets, that's probably important there, oh, and, and of course also oil, oil and gas, or acquisition of quasi-monopolies uh, that uh, uh, benefit uh, America. Now, in the case of Russia, what was this crisis, historical crisis? Well, shock therapy. That was de devastation for the Russian economy. A lot of factories closed down, uh, there was unrest in the country, um, and and this was seen as 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 a as a as a as, 
as, in many cases, as, as, as a disaster, a disastrous economic uh, problem that was self-inflicted as a result of uh, uh, um, as a result of the collapse of the Soviet Union. So it's it, it is trying to address the the Eu the Eurasian Economic Union is trying to address a historical crisis of of uh, the failure of neoliberal globalization. Uh, in particular, the, the rise of uh, finance, finance capital, uh, and how this tends to take on more importance than real economy. So the virtual paper economy tends to be given more prominence under neoliberalism than, uh, than under uh, uh, other regimes. So what Eurasian Economic Union tries, is trying to do is very much trying to invest in real economies. Right? So into manufacturing. It's not merely about putting money into finance, which is what you had under neoliberalism, but very much trying to invest in real manufacturing uh, uh, industries uh, and, and innovation. Okay, and how will this benefit uh, uh, Russia? Economies of scale, right? So you have export-led uh, growth, very much what the Thai countries did in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, you know, they operated behind a tariff barrier, which allowed their industries to grow. Uh, and what Russia is trying to do is, is trying to ensure that uh, that a lot of the companies that are running at a loss can over time be rescued uh, as a result of export-led uh, growth. And what's the crisis that we get with, uh, uh, with China? China just has too much capital. <laughs> uh, it just, it's so rich, it's it doing remarkably well, it just doesn't know what to do with, 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 its, with its capital. So a lot of a lot of its capital gets is used to purchase U.S. Treasury bonds, uh, to buy up real estate uh, here in, in in London elsewhere. But this is but this is but this leads to other problems because capital needs to be valorized, otherwise it becomes devalued, and that's a crisis. So uh, uh, what China is trying to do is trying to valorize capital by trying to invest in long-term projects, which will hopefully over time will bring back uh, some sort of returns. So a lot of these investments are long-term investments. They're not merely short-term investments which is going to give out immediate returns, but long-term. So they're deferred strategy. It's a deferred strategy, a long-term strategy, um, uh, as well as also trying to address problems of uh, uh, declining profits. Okay. Now, uh, so hopefully what this tries to show you though, right, but by me looking at these various crises, is to show how the strategies that these global powers are, have, have developed and devised are partly as a result of their internal problems, internal contradictions and crises of their own capitalist economies, which they then are trying to address by trying to shape the region in particular ways. Right? Whether it be through deregalization in the case of the, uh, uh, the Washington Consensus or the Custom Union in the case of the uh, uh, Eurasian Union or the uh, transport, uh, 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 new transport infrastructure in the case of the Belt and Road Initiative. How long do you have time? Maybe just like five, ten minutes. And okay, then great. Then okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, for discussion. Right, yeah. So, what are my kind of uh, second? second set of findings. I probably won't have enough time to go into this, uh, but what we did find was uh, that, that the, nation st the nation states, Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan, uh, weren't indifferent. Uh, they weren't merely just kind of collecting money from, from these various international financial institutions, but very much tried to pay them off uh, in order to get good terms for its own country. Uh, you know, be a ridiculous scenario uh, for countries to uh, have loans and debt that it that it need not have, or, or at, uh, in term or, 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 or in terms uh, that are unfavourable to it. So they would pay off uh, uh, international financial institutions 
in order to get the most competitive terms. Um, what we also see is uh, that uh, the financial institutions themselves collaborate, right? So although they are in competition with each other, there is a degree of complementarity uh, uh, between the various institutions, uh, especially in funding major projects such as transport and energy. Um, and I can just quickly show you this by this slide here. Uh, so you have the two uh, countries, Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan, and these are the kind of projects that the uh, Western, uh, so that the IMF uh, uh, branch institutions were undertaking. Whether it be, so clearly the most important one for Western-led branch institutions was the financial sector and the, and the small businesses and, and corporations there, uh, as well as also uh, public and energy infrastructure, which is also replicated to a certain extent by what some of the other financial institutions were also doing, right? So these weren't necessarily mutually exclusive, to, uh, right, in terms of how they're investing, uh, but, so the, but, the, but, the, but the emphasis was slightly different. So if in the case of Western-led uh, uh, financial institutions with finance and, and, and the private sector, in case of the, uh, uh, the Russian-led uh, financial institutions with bad manufacturing and export-led industries, uh, uh, Finance did play a role, but very, but, but more towards the bottom, right? It wasn't a top priority, as in the case of the Western uh, financial institutions. Um, again, we see a commonality here that infrastructure uh, goes across the region here, right? So transport infrastructure plays more of a role in the Chinese model. Yes, it also plays a role in the uh, Western one, but this was more about transport, this is also about, not just about transport, but it's also about energy as well. Right? So, there's, so there's a degree of comp uh, complementarities going on uh, uh, in, in, in these uh, uh, fixes. Okay, and finally, if I can just add, in terms of my critique here, right? What I'm, what I'm, what I'm arguing is that these are capitalist fixes, uh, that although they are competing, uh, although we sometimes think of Russia and China as, op as operating an anti-capitalist agenda, far from it. I'm, 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 I'm saying they're, they're not doing that at all. Um, so, but, 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 but then what's my critique of this? Well, my critique is that, that the kind of fixes that we need are for crises that none of the major global powers are addressing. That's about the environmental crisis. Right, they're singularly failing on, on, on this. Um, they're singularly failing on addressing issues of social justice, the huge inequalities within, within their own societies. The oligarchs, for instance, uh, whether it be in Russia or in China, or whether it be the 1% or the 0.1% in America. <coughs> so we need to think about another type of fix uh, which are called the uh, which 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 uh, political economists in in working on environment have called the contraction convergence strategy, which is about ensuring that 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 each person is allowed to uh, uh, have certain percentage of carbon dioxide emissions, and and no one person has should have, be allowed to have more than the other, and if this is the case, then what we need to see. It's actually degrowth in the northern hemisphere. So we need Europe and the West to not to grow, but to degrow, right? Uh, to contract, and for there to be slow growth or non-growth in the southern hemisphere. If we are serious about addressing the major crises, yes, financial crisis has taken has has, has something that uh, has something that will become extremely. Um, uh, uh, have, have become uh, um, have, have, have galvanized us uh, in terms of how to address it, but as I said it, it misses our, our attention about the major bigger ones. So we need to think about a low carbon economy. In, in, in addition to this, I think we also need to pay attention to the issue of, of social justice, uh, about how to think about enterprises and, and businesses in a way that is not capitalistic, that 
is more not for profit, not for profit, uh, and um, led by um, or organised by workers' cooperatives. And if you think, well, this is just a, a pipe dream. Uh, just think about Mondrian, uh, the largest uh, cooperatives in Europe, in the vast country in Spain, hugely successful. Right? If, 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 if you think this is not workable, they work extremely well in, in, in Mondrian. Uh, it's just that uh, state uh, just doesn't allow the conditions for it to be replicated elsewhere. And we need to also think about how we think about work, right? uh, work in which we share jobs. Uh, so it's not just one person monopolising a good job, but by sharing that job, right? Uh, you know, we have you know extremely smart people, but not enough jobs uh, for them to occupy. So we need to think about different ways about how how we can get smart people to work in those good jobs, sharing them, uh, as well as also sharing the good and bad tasks that go with those jobs. Um, so, and, and, and that's what I mean by another kind of fix, right? What we call a social justice fix, that none of the global powers are doing. That's right, so if I can just then just conclude on this, uh, hopefully what I want to try to suggest to you is that the global powers are very much about employing fixes to address weaknesses, problems, crises, contradictions in their own economies, not in the Central Asian economies. It's very much about addressing their own issues. Um, and that these fixes reflect a broader economic and political domination, as well as contestation. Um, and that this is giving rise, especially uh, with China and Russia, to what can be called a, a county US economic hegemony. Not capitalism, but US hegemony. Um, and not only, as I said in the, in the last slide, None of these uh, are really addressing the bigger issue, the bigger crisis that we're all facing, which is about the environment and solidarity. Thank you.